Spanish is a romantic language. And because it is romantic, it's the opposite of mechanical. And repetition is important to remember. You see? Uh, but in, in English, the language is already so practical, so down to earth, that you don't need the repetition. It's just there, clearly. Thank you for downloading this podcast. You're listening to Gnostic Lectures. In this episode, this is episode number seven, we're going to be talking about just conversations about Gnosis. Every three or so lectures, we've decided just to have a free discussion about Gnosis. Um, with me, my co-host is E. Jim G. Ross. How are you today, Jim? Fine, thank you, Rick. It's a pleasure again to be here. Actually, it's an honor, as I said it before, to be connected with you, with rickyradio.com, plus with the entire human race that I consider my real family on Earth. We were just talking before we started the recorder about um, the psychology of, of people in, in the English language versus the Spanish language, and we were just talking about how some people like repetition and others don't. And we were, we were addressing the content of this lecture and how I was basically saying that we don't want to keep repeating certain things over and over again because English speaking people don't like to hear repetition. And you, you were telling me that in Spanish, it's just the opposite. You know, this is very interesting, but based on my own personal experience as a bilingual individual who speaks English and Spanish, uh, Spanish is a romantic language and being romantic, you know, to express a point, we never go directly into the center of the idea. We go in circles, you know, slowly, slowly trying to capture everything possible before we reach the point. This is a tendency within the, the language itself, you know, as a romantic language, we feel that we have to express our love and attraction for the universe for life, you know, for nature, for people. And of course, you know, saying I love you, that said, it's not enough. You know, but if we say, well, you know, you're so beautiful, life is great, you know, I'm happy that we have met, you know, and then in Spanish, we say all of that. And in my experience, um, there's two kinds of people in the world. The, the technical people who love the internet, they're very abrupt to the point, this is the way it is. Few words. The the um, Bill Gates, um, the uh, people who have done well on the internet, all of the tech geeks, they just say one little thing and that's it. But the vast majority, even in English, the vast majority of people out there, if you're a salesman, okay, and I'm not a very good salesman, um, if you're a salesman, you will always repeat the same thing several times from different angles. And that way, um, the law of three for salesmen, if you're a salesman and you want to make a sale, you will attack it at least three times from, from different directions, right? Yeah. Well, do you know, the main reason for that is not the, then we begin to agree that people need sometimes repetition because yes. normally me, when you listen, you're watching a movie or you're listening to a lecture or you're reading a book, how much mm -hmm. attention are you paying to what you're doing, you know? approximately 10%, between 10 to 25%. We are missing 75% of the information. So the purpose of selling is to sell, to connect, to make people buy. So when you repeat, then you're touching that other 75% unconscious when people were not paying attention to what you wanted to tell them. You see, either you're writing, you're watching a movie, you're reading, or you're listening to it you know, a conversation or a, or a speech. So two things that, that uh, you wanted to talk about that I felt were covered more and more in previous lectures. One is Darwin 
and the other is the Big Bang. And I was saying the, the reason why this discussion came about in the first place is because I thought the listeners had a little bit too much of Darwin already. But let's um, talk about Darwin again, because there's obviously more to this, isn't there? And let me also say that that the body of knowledge that Samuel and Weir has given us is so extensive, there has to be overlap from one lecture lecture to another, from one idea to another. There has to be overlap because it's so extensive, right? That's correct. But let's you know, talk about Darwin. You know, the, we, ha we haven't heard enough about Darwin yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you're right. You're right. You know, I, why I said that I feel it is my duty. My sense of duty is pushing me to do this. Why? Because I'm exploring reality and I'm also searching for the truth. Okay, the truth. Is there anything more important than the truth? Some people say, well, there is no truth, you know, because everything is relative. Wrong. You know, uh, actually, Albert Einstein never said that everything was relative. He only said time and space are relative. And we've heard that many times before, yeah. but it's, it, it is important. I realize that. Yeah. Yes. So basically, why are we coming into Darwin so frequently? Because, you know, scientists and intellectual individuals or university professors or whatever, they are making of Darwin theory of evolution of the species, they are making of it a dogma. And this is absolutely against scientific research. When you make a dogma or something and you're wrong, you are committing a real crime. This is a scientific crime. You know, this is something that you cannot forgive because we're teaching people the wrong way. We're making people believe something that is not true. And that's to me a very serious matter. This is why we have to come back and come back and come back and to be heard and heard and heard a million times, a million times, a trillion times, if it is possible. Because in reality, you know, Darwin was incomplete. And as we said before, Pasteur, another great scientist, you know, criticized Darwin. And of course, he said that Darwin was incomplete. Evolution is a reality. It's a cosmic law. It's a law of nature. But there is another law that Darwin ignored completely, which is the opposite of evolution, which is involution, involution or devolution, which is returning to the original point, up and down, up and down. Now, you see, so essentially, you know, we explained that before a few times, you know. Well, what? Can, I, can I say a few things? Of course. The theory of evolution is so entrenched in people's mind. You know how it is with a theory. It starts off with a theory and people pass it back and forth. They kick it around. Sometimes decades roll by, maybe even a hundred years rolls by. And that theory becomes so entrenched that they think of it as axiomatic, as a law. It isn't. They think of it that way, but it isn't. And uh, I happen to like Star Trek, and I've noticed on some of the Star Trek Voyager episodes, we have all kinds of uh, uh, take it for granted that it's Darwin's theory of evo Dar Darwin's evolution, and they're not even calling it a theory anymore. They, they're they're accepting it as a law. It's not a law. And let's let's beat this Darwin thing to death because uh, I. There's two schools with, with evolution. One is the religionist school, and the other one is the, the atheist or the Darwinistic school. The people who, who believe in Darwin think that, uh, you know, it's, it's the evolution of the species. And the people who are religionists, in my opinion, are, are almost just as bad because they just depend on faith without any, um, um, what would you call it? There's two words that come to mind here. The the a priori and empirical knowledge, okay? Um, these two words, uh, they're, they're, they're words that, that are well known. A priori is something that you can get knowledge directly from, from the um, internal world, perhaps, or whatever. But empirical knowledge is, is what you would accept in a court of law, the physical knowledge. Am I correct in those two, two terms? Yes, yes. So the religionists are, are saying, okay, I accept God created everything, and they're, they're totally rejecting the Darwinism. 
and uh, it's a creationist theory, and it's fine, but they don't have anything to bring into a court of law to prove that one way or the other. There was actually a movie about that one time, and um, it doesn't help us to get into that sort of thing right now. But those are the two schools of thought, but neither one takes into consideration gnosis, and I really want to, at some point in this podcast, get into a priori and direct communications with your monad. I, I was hoping to do that at some point, maybe later on. But we're still talking about Darwin. And the Gnostic view is in between the two of them. Okay. And it gives, the, the, in the last podcast, we had the history of, of the earth and the history of the human race. To me, that was... It's a very long podcast, and it's a lot of information to take in. And we were talking about how people watch TV and listen to audio, and they only absorb a small percentage of it, and they have to keep repeating. If they want to really absorb it, they have to perhaps listen to podcasts more than once. Mm-hmm. That's, that's correct. You know, essentially, this is important to be remembered also. Um, the Pope, the actual Pope and the Pope before, John Paul before, he did mention that evolution is a reality. So creation is a cosmic law and evolution is another cosmic law. So they do agree with a Gnostic perception of reality. So that means religion is moving into also the scientific field because we will have in the near future a specific lecture. Its title will be probably you know, religion will become scientific and science will become religious. Mm-hmm. You see, because the coincidences are developing more and more and more. And through Gnosis, we can really develop incredible perceptions of reality that will confirm, you know, that possibility, which is more than a possibility, because the universe, reality itself, it has to be explored in a very serious manner and with a tremendous respect for life. And, you know, when, when for example, the, the theory of the Big Bang, okay, this is another wrong approach into reality because it's like life started after a huge, gigantic, cosmic explosion in the universe. Come on, you know. That sounds like a cartoon movie. A cartoon movie, you know, a, a movie made for children and entertaining purpose only, you know, without any educational purpose. Come on, you know, this is based on the psychology of war. Oh, if we drop bombs here and there, a nuclear explosion is maybe, oh, we have to kneel down before the majesty of the nuclear explosion. Come on, you know, this is absolutely ridiculous. We cannot use this kind of tricks to impress an audience, you know. We have to be more respectful about reality, about nature, and about spirituality. And this is why the Big Bang has nothing to do with the birth of life. You know, all religions, actually, when you study religions in depth, then the way we do it in Gnosis. For example, the Jewish religion, okay? They teach about the absolute, not only the Jewish religion, the Hindu religion also, and all ancient religions describe the Absolute in a beautiful and respectful manner. The Absolute is a spiritual sun, we could say a spiritual universe. Behind every physical sun, there is a spiritual sun, and that's the Absolute. That, listen to this carefully and try to remember my words. The Absolute has always been will always be. And the absolute is not tied to time. That's correct. And that's why everything in the universe, according to Albert Einstein anyway, has relativity with time. That's correct. Yeah. It's not imprisoned within time. And it's not imprisoned within evolution involution, which are mechanical laws. It's not imprisoned within time and space. You see, it's higher than space and it's higher than time. So our poor little brains won't be able to understand easily this concept that life can only descend from life 
the absolute is life forever. It has always been, it will always be. So life descended from the absolute. The absolute created the universe, created the spirit and created matter. The spirit is the masculine aspect of creation and nature, the universe, is the feminine aspect of nature. So we can say the spirit is light when it descends into the universe, it becomes fire, the masculine aspect of life, and the universe is water. You know, our organism is made of water, 80% or more. And of course, within water, you find minerals, you find the earth, you find the air, you find, you know, everything which is connected with nature. And of course, the universe was created through the spirit and matter masculine and feminine aspect. We always need a man and a woman to create life. So, and at the end of a cosmic day, because life is a great school of learning, we all return to the absolute. But to the absolute, matter cannot return. What returns is the spirit, the light that descended from the absolute, you know, and we will return to a cosmic night. When a planet dies, then we enter into a cosmic night and we all return to the absolute. So life can only, life can only descend from life. Please remember that. Remember my words and stop believing in such a ridiculous approach into reality, which is the Big Bang Theory. Ladies and gentlemen, remember my words. There's several things I want to discuss about the last lecture. I was a little confused when you were talking about rounds and races. And I, I don't want to get into the um, depth of it that you did in the last lecture. But what is a round? Yeah, essentially, you know, uh, we use the word round to describe the movement of the particles, atomic particles, you know. The electrons move around the center of the, of the atomic particle and this is around you know rounding rounding and so remember that the straight line doesn't exist the straight line is part of the curve yeah everything in the universe even according to walter russell is spir spiral in nature yeah that's correct so basically you know it's important to understand better the concept of the absolute and the universe so the absolute manifest through the black holes you know, scientists are very much lost regarding the interpretation of the purpose of a black hole. So we can say life descends from the absolute through the black holes into the universe. And at the end of a cosmic day, the same spiritual being that we, we all are will return to the absolute through the same black holes. Right. It's like inhaling and exhaling life. So around means, you know, after we descend here, you know, the spirit immerses within matter, and matter is the one that is in motion. Remember, in motion and this in a spiral way, and this is the way we call it a round. But the round means, you know, there is a, an evolutionary round, so. but also an involutionary coming and returning, coming and returning. Okay, so I'm still not clear. Um, we have uh, the Lemu the first race was the um, oh, I'm trying to remember the name of the first race because I want to get this straight. The, the protoplasmatic. Proto. Protoplasmatic. Now, now, protoplasma in blood. You know. Now is that a round? That existence of that uh, type of being was was the first round? No, no. Essentially, you know, we could say that um, there are seven rounds. Okay. What would be the first round then? No, the first round is an atomic round. It means, you know, what was first created within nature, you know, because when, when a new planet is created... I think in terms of solidification and rarification, basically yeah. the first rounds were not as solid, right? Yeah, the first round is atomic, 
Yes, but know? I'm trying to get the, the difference between the races and the rounds, yeah, and then the sub races. Yeah, don't speak about the races yet. Okay. Okay, because we will make it more complex. <laughs> that's that's where I'm. I'm very com uh, uh, confused right now. Yes. Yeah, essentially, you know, a round represents, you know, the creation of planet Earth at the very beginning. So, you know, matter. That's the descent of spirit into matter for the first time, right? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. So when the spirit descends into matter and the planet is created, because the, the now, fire now, and the water... Now, once that first planet is created, does it support seven races at that time and then it goes on oh, to the next round? Also, but a different kind of race. Yes, I understand so that. So the first round is atomic, okay? <clears throat> and some esoteric schools call it mental, which is the same, yeah. because every thought is atomic. Scientists don't use those terms yet, because they, they want to verify first that the mind and the atoms are connected. So every thought we say is atomic. So what round, see we've covered a lot of this in another lecture and I don't want to really cover it all exactly the same again. So what round are we in now? No, we are in the, in the fourth round. Fourth round. The fourth round. So basically, the first round was atomic. Yeah. So the Earth was atomic. I, we, we should say transparent gas, you know, at the yeah. beginning is gas. Nebulous. The creation of the planet. Nebulous. Nebulous, right? that's yeah. correct. So, As a matter of fact, we have nebul nebulae in the, in the heavens. If you look at telescopes, you can see uh, systems that are called nebulous, right? That's correct. So basically, either they are planets emerging or they are planets returning yes. to the absolute. Yeah. You know, life is coming in or life is going out. So, but life is really spiritual at the beginning. The, the real life is spiritual, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just... The, the, the matter part of it is more the robotic part, right? Yeah, it's the vehicle. Yeah. The vehicle or the wardrobe of the spirit yeah. to move, you know, within the physical universe. That's a little clearer. So in each round we have seven races. We have seven races and also we have, you know, this is the, the, the interesting part because when a baby is procreated, you know, through the spermatozoa and the ovule of the physical father, the physical mother, yes. they say, oh, there is no life and then abortion is okay. No, it's not okay because life is already there immediately yeah. within the father and within the mother. And they are given the physical body to the spirit that is awaiting for the body. And that's the beginning of that physical body. But the spirit was always there. Mm -hmm. So essentially, you know, the first round is atomic or mental. So the earth had already all kingdoms, mineral kingdom, but atomic only. It wasn't cellular or, or molecular. It was just atomic gas, you know. Yes. And we had also vegetals, vegetal kingdom, mm -hmm. and we have an animal kingdom, and also people, species, angelical being, you know, were here at that time. They were the, the beginners of life because they had to structure and organize the new planet. Then the second round, after millions and millions and millions of years, became molecular. Yeah. So the, the molecular universe was created. So the Earth, we can say two different Earths, interconnected, but becoming part of a, a cosmic organism because the Earth is alive. It's alive and intelligent. Some people, you know, I have a lot of friends who are atheists, and they are my friends, you know. We, we have the right to disagree. And they always argue with me, saying, no, nature is there, but nature cannot be intelligent. There is no consciousness in nature. Every, I, everything is alive. And my, my answer is, no, you, I disagree with you respectfully, you know. And this is one of the sad things about uh, Native people, Native North American Indians, knew very well. I mean, we're not uh, suggesting that people change to that uh, type of uh, thinking, but they certainly knew about uh, nature being alive. That's correct. You know? Yes, yes. Actually, you know, when you enter into these studies and you develop your knowledge about esoteric, you know, esoteric perception or reality, <clears throat> then you realize that every atomic particle is alive. You know, there are invisible beings that move the air that move the ocean, that move the fire, that move the earth. The mineral kingdom is alive, you know. A mine is a family of 
a spiritual individual that live inside the gold, inside the copper, inside the lead, etc., etc., etc. But scientists don't realize it because they don't have the instrument to verify that. But if you can awaken your superior senses, like, for example, what we call the third eye or clairvoyance or the pituitary gland, we will be able to see those beautiful individuals that live within the mineral kingdom. So all nature is alive. Every atomic particle pulsates. It means there is a heart inside of that atomic particle. There is life that pulsates. Okay, try to remember that, please. So the second round was molecular. Yeah, we don't want to repeat the entire lecture over no, again. No, of, <laughs> of course not. And then the third round was etheric. Why etheric? Ether is a magnetic field. It's, a, it's an element of nature that very much used in, you know, surgery to make people fall asleep before an operation. But at the same time, ether is the element that reigns within the universe, within space, among planets. You know, that's the fourth dimension. And in art, in Gnostic terms, ether, of course, means um, actually the, the correct definition is everything, everywhere, right? That's correct. Because yes. as a fish swims in water, the, the fish has no knowledge of water, has no concept of what water is, where water is, any understanding about water, but yet it lives and swims in the water. And we do the same thing with ether. We're, we're totally immersed in the ether and it is a life form. That's correct. You know, it's also the same magnetic field that Albert Einstein discovered the fourth dimension, which is the same etheric universe, another planet Earth made of ether, you know, interconnected, interrelated. We could say another aspect of the nature of planet Earth. So there were also a species there, you know, mineral, vegetal and humans, animals and humans. And, and now we are in the fourth, the fourth round which is cellular. Cells, you know, everything is cellular today. Even some insects are molecular, you know. The, it, they say if we have a nuclear holocaust, these molecular insects will survive, which is true. It's amazing. They can have uh, microorganisms living in acid uh, deep in the ocean or in the stratosphere or and, and almost anywhere. There's a life form that will survive, right? Yes. They say if we have a nuclear holocaust that the cockroaches will be the only survivors, maybe. <laughs> yes. No, you're right. So essentially, you know, uh, for example, Samailan Veor, the founder of Gnostic Anthropology, uh, an incredible superior individual, uh, we could say an archangel reincarnated on earth to help us, like many other superior beings doing the same work. But Samaila Onveor describes something very interesting regarding the prehistoric animal, those, those gigantic animals, you know, described in history or in prehistory. What are they? What, when they disappear, where, where are they gone? So Mylon Veor says something very interesting. He said, those animals, gigantic animals, they live today in the air. They are tiny little microorganisms that float within the air. If we can capture them and look them through the microscope, we will see the same gigantic animals, but now with a tiny little you know, physicality. So this is the law of involution. They are returning to the absolute. As a species, they disappear physically, but they continue living within the parallel universes. So they are returning already to the absolute. So what about extinction? The whole notion of extinction means basically, yes, you can have the dinosaurs become extinct on this planet, but the idea of dinosaurs still exists in creation, in the, in the absolute. The, there are other planets similar to ours, who knows what exactly, but uh, there might be life forms like that on other planets. I mean, the idea isn't gone just because they're not here. It's sort of like Earth is, is a garden. And uh, while well, you don't have peas in the garden or you don't have carrots, but you do have other things, well, somebody else's garden might have those, right? Yes, you know, actually what happens on Earth, 
repeats in every planet within the universe. So life has existence in every planet, even we like it or not. It could be, as we said it before, it could be atomic life, and that's it, or it could be molecular life, it could be aesthetic life, or even cellular life. But life is everywhere, except in a moon. A moon is a dead planet, so this is part of extinction, okay? When a planet dies, then it becomes a moon. All moons of the universe used to be planets with life within, within them, and now they are dead. They will transform slowly, slowly into cosmic dust. They become asteroids, you know, and this is why the asteroids are also traveling, but they used to be part of planets. So I have to ask you this, okay? Um, there's two moons. Earth has two satellites, two moons. Uh, not not man-made satellites, but the other dark moon is talked about quite a bit in Gnostic teachings, right? Yes. And yes. and do we know about that? I I don't know if NASA knows about it. But, yeah, uh, they do. They do. They do. Even they gave a name to it, which is Lilith. Lilith, L I L I T H, and according to Kabbalah, you know Lilith is the black moon, which is like an asteroid next to our physical moon and they call in also esoteric language the white moon the big one that we see every night Nahema Nahema and Lilith in esoteric studies you know both represent you know the two wives of Adam when Adam fell from a stage of grace but of course it's a symbolic aspect but on the other side, you know, Lilith is a dead planet, the same way Nahema is another dead planet. And those people who render cult to the moon, to the two moons, in reality, you know, they are inviting death to come. And sometimes not even death, you know, negative forces that are connected, you know, with death, you know, like... Uh, you know, negativity, um, illness, you know, even hatred, you know. The, the moon has a tremendous gravitation on Earth, but in reality the moon doesn't inhale life from us. We do the opposite. We are the vampire because we are alive. The planet Earth, we can say, vampirizes the moon. So we are attracting atoms from the moon from a dead planet. And this is why we become a lunar humanity unless we learn to transform ourselves into solar individuals, receiving the benefit of the sun and the stars instead of getting that negativity coming from the moon, which is, you know, in a stage of involution, devolution, in a stage of death. So when, when we when you mentioned also before, you know, extinction, yeah. um, we should remember uh, the man of Cromagnon and the man of Nardental, you know, described by Darwin and his followers. In reality, these two um, kind of individuals that lived only 8,000 years ago, 8,000 years ago, and they disappeared mysteriously, and they say they are our ancestors, you know. That's another crime committed against humanity. Because... Oh, wait a minute. Who's committing the crime here? Darwin? Well, the followers of Darwin. Okay. The followers, because in reality, when they become dogmatic about Darwin theories, nobody has the right to discuss them or to criticize them or yeah. to disagree with them. So we're talking about the caveman, basically, right? The caveman, you know, yeah. they lived only 8,000 years ago. And we explain in, in past lectures, where are they coming from? They were a species in extinction, two species in extinction. They, were, they are not really our ancestors. They were degenerated individuals that lived before, coming from races that, that fell from a stage of grace because our original ancestors were superior beings, angelical beings, that were planted here on Earth to organize life on Earth. The situation is, this is part of a cosmic divine plan 
that happens in every planet. So superior beings have to organize because they have the knowledge to organize life in a planet. But after that, they are being tested also. The way we are being tested, even if we don't realize it. You said it, you know, we live in an aesthetic universe also. We don't even perceive it, you know, mm -hmm. we don't yeah. see it. And it's the same magnetic field discovered by Albert Einstein, you know, telephones, uh, cell phones, internet, you know, uh, television, radio, they are all connected with the fourth dimension. So let's come back. Well, to I have a problem with that because I have an electronics background and I've never been involved in the fourth dimension in any of that stuff because uh, anyway, um, it, it might seem mysterious to a lot of people that the technology is somehow in the fourth dimension, but uh, uh, I guess to backpedal a little bit, I have to say that uh, the theory of electricity isn't even properly comprehended, you know. That, that's totally correct, you know. It, it is correct. Because the electricity is the same fire. It's the same Holy Spirit. You don't like it? The way I say it, I describe it? Well, we have the right to disagree. But in reality, the Holy Spirit is the same electricity. You know what? My grandfather uh, one time said... Uh, told me, he said, electricity is nothing but heat. And he was, uh, before he died, he told me that. And he really honestly believed that electricity was just heat. Well, you know, I was laughing at him because I was studying electronics at the time and I knew the theory of how electrons move from one atom to another. And I go, ha, 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 yeah, this guy's so full of it, right? But uh, yeah, young people always laugh at older people. That's uh, even happening all the time. But um, was he so far wrong in his theory? I mean... No, he was right, you know, 100%. <laughs> the situation is, you know, when we die, the electricity of the body is gone. It means life is gone. The Holy Spirit is gone. So then we are dead. Our physical matter becomes what? Cold and in a stage of deep degeneration. We become worms after that. Yeah. So, in reality, you know, the Holy Spirit is the same electricity. And that electricity is the one that interconnects cells from, you know, molecules and from atomic particles. And, and the interesting part is the same electrons, the electronic energy that surrounds the atomic particles. You know, they are free. There are free electrons. It means guided by a superior cosmic intelligence. And they are the ones that travel through a space which is light crystallized. The spirit descending from the absolute must crystallize to connect with matter and to develop matter. Otherwise, there is no creation. There is no life. So Coming back, you know, into the man of Cromagnon and the man of Nardental, they are a species and an extinction, in extinction. People who enter into deep stage of degeneration and they end up mixing with animals in the middle of global catastrophes that the earth has experienced in the past. These people escape to the mountains and after you live in the mountains for thousands and thousands of years, what happens to you? You become an animal. You know, especially if you become more and more unconscious about your own situation. You're escaping from, you know, collective tragedies that were faced when there were earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, tsunamis. And of course, you become mentally unstable and probably sexually also you become into, you enter into a stage of deep degeneration. And according to Gnostic anthropology, these individuals, mixed with animals. And this is why the cave people are never our ancestors. They are just a degenerated species that came from superior beings similar to us or higher than the way we are today. Because the survivors of those catastrophes who had the knowledge didn't live with the cave people. They had already a civilization. You remember the ancient Egyptians they lived 25,000 years ago here. When the cave people were in the middle of the forest, in the middle of earthquakes and global catastrophe, the Egyptians had a beautiful life. They had knowledge, you know. They knew how to use electricity, magnetic field, you know. They had spaceships. They moved those gigantic rocks from faraway places to build the pyramids. 
They have knowledge about mathematics, knowledge about science. It has to be. I mean, it has to be that the Egyptians moved these big rocks with some kind of energy. And of course, we as Gnostics uh, say that it's uh, Christic energy or um, the fire within, or I'm not sure exactly what words to use, but there's no evidence to suggest anything else. That's correct. You know, mm -hmm. even, you know, there is a new field in anthropology or archaeology called Egyptology. Yeah. Why? Why? Because it was too much for official science to be comprehended. They had to put everything together in one package. And they are still puzzled because they don't say what we are saying. We understand clearly what happened to the Egyptians. The Egyptians, you know, are, were connected with these angelical humanities that lived on earth. They were planted in the fourth round, which is the cellular round, our actual round. They were planted, but they were not the first race of the fourth round. They were actually number three, you know? So they were not as developed as people from ancient China or Tibet, ancient Tibet, or the ancient Aztecs and Mayans and Peruvians, in this case, the, you know, in ancient Peru, we had the Wiracocha, which is connect, called the, the Christ of the Incas. Yes. They were survivors, you know, from Atlantis, the missing civilization that existed one million years ago. And these people, a million years ago, they had a technology more advanced than our actual technology today. Does it sound crazy? It does, maybe, but be open to different alternatives. Are we evolving today? The answer is no. So a question. The Atlanteans, were they in the fourth round or were they in the third round? I'm a little confused about yeah, that. Yeah, no, basically, you know, the Atlanteans were in the third, um, I'm sorry, the Atlanteans were in the fourth round. So that's our round. Our so, actual round, yeah. So, so were the fifth, uh, may, uh, ray, ray, uh, what do you call it, sub-races? No, no, basically, basically... Root, they call it root races, right? Yeah, we are the fifth, number five. Number five, because in the cellular universe, we've been already five races. Yeah, okay. And the first three races were angelical. Mm -hmm. They were superior beings, gigantic individuals, you know. There is evidence about that. We mentioned that before. Well, I mean, there's lots of evidence to show that there have been giants on Earth. Yes, yeah. And they were our real ancestors. They were our real ancestors. Yeah. So basically, and at the third human race stage, there was a collapse, you know, of uh, everything. Because this is what the Bible calls the fall of Adam and, and Eve. They lost paradise. It means they lost consciousness. They lost their superior senses. They used to have 12 senses minimum. And they lost seven superior senses. And here we are with only five because we entered also into degeneration. But we have the option, it's up to us. And this is why Gnostic anthropology is teaching us how to go up again, how to get back those seven superior senses, which is learning to become normal. Are we abnormal? Well, I don't want to insult anybody. But in reality, we enter into involution. We are not evolving any longer. We descended from a stage of grace, and now our duty, our mission, this is the purpose of life, is to go back into our, you know, grace stage that was given to us by Mother Nature and the Divinity. So, Basic, basically, there's two more things I would like to touch on, if I can. One is... On the web page, one of our web pages, we have that there's a whole list of people, Walter Russell, uh, Edgar Cayce, um, uh, Mary Baker Eddy. There's a few um, other names that are very, very well known, uh, people who have brought important information to the world. And I say on uh, one of the web pages that Samuel Unwear is at the top of the list. What I mean by that is that all of these other people contributed wonderful information to humanity, but it is my sincere opinion that Samuel Anver has brought the most important knowledge 
to the world. And that's one of the reasons for Gnostic lectures. That's why we're doing this. But also Gnosis is uh, knowing. And I'd like to have, it, with your permission, Jim, a little explanation here. Uh, I want to give an explanation as to why this body of knowledge is different from the others. And it's different in this respect. Here's a challenge to our listener. You will at some point go to bed tonight and get up in the morning and you will have a dream. And that dream might have some symbolism in it. And what you're going to do with that symbolism is uh, the very highly probable that it will relate to something that you're listening to or have listened to in this series of podcasts. And I want you to pay attention before you're, you start moving your muscles in the morning to pay attention to what images you're given. Because this is where we jump off from the book reading, uh, information collecting, do nothing type of uh, podcast into the, the opposite of that, which is a, a totally involved and in, you go from, from studying to knowing. The gnosis part of this is knowing. And what you're going to have is, let me describe that each individual listening to this podcast has a monad. The Gnostics call it a monad. Christians call it God or uh, whatever name your religion happens to refer to it. It's, it's the divinity within. And that divinity wants to carry on a two-way conversation with you. And so what's going to happen when you wake up tomorrow morning is you're going to have an image. And let me say that the image of a lion is symbolic of your father within. Okay. So if you happen to have that kind of an image, pay attention. Is it a lion that's happy? Is it a lion that's angry? Uh, pay attention to the dream because only you can interpret that. Uh, it is your God within trying to communicate with you. And this is your opportunity to step out of the intellectual aspect of Gnosis and enter the real Gnosis. And I, I want to challenge each and every listener to pay attention to your dreams tomorrow morning, the next morning, and every morning. Because from now on, the images that you get in your dreams will mean something. And you have to remember that it is your monad trying to communicate to you. This is, sounds ridiculous, but it is the only way of knowing. Gnosis is knowing. So let's begin the process. Yeah, you know, that's extremely important. So uh, no, uh, Gnosis means knowledge, knowing. So that means knowing what? You know, knowing ourselves. That's the key point, because we are a doctrine of the synthesis. The same doctrine of the synthesis was given to humanity already by Jesus Christ, Moses, Buddha, Krishna, Mohammed, you know, Hermes Trismegistos, you know, Wiracocha, Quetzalcoatl, all masters of founders of religions. They came to teach the doctrine of the synthesis. And now we are bringing it back. This is why we say all religions are good, because they all teach the same principles. And as we said it before, you know, in the future, in the near future, religion will become scientific and science will become religious. And the only way that it can become scientific, in fact, is to re know that the human mechanism, including everything that's inside of us, is uh, as a collective thing, a, a scientific instrument. And if our bodies and the internal bodies and our soul within are a scientific instrument, then we can use all of those faculties and abilities to find out about the universe. That's correct. So basically, you know, we, we could say, as we said it before, we are a perfect representation of our galaxy. We are the galaxy. You know, we, every atomic particle is connected with every planet within the galaxy. How many millions of planets? How many millions of atomic particles do we have? So when we learn to illuminate every atomic particle 
we become the galaxy. We can ascend into a degree of perfection we cannot even imagine. And this is why Jesus Christ came to teach that. And Moses and Buddha and Krishna and, and all the other, you know, masters of the White Lodge that came to teach humanity how to get out of the animal kingdom, because we are still part of the animal kingdom, to move into the real humans. And after that, to become suprahumans, but never through evolution, but through a tremendous revolution and of this, our soul. Our and, and this is the beginning of the revolution to first of all establish a two-way communication with the monad. And what I would like our listeners to do is to pay attention to the images. You don't even have to be sleeping to get an image. You can be quiet. And an image might come in your into your mind, into your mind's eye. And you have to remember that every individual on earth has a monad. And that monad has been trying to communicate with you, the lower part, for a long, long time. And you've been ignoring and ignoring and ignoring these little... The, the method of communication is through images. And when you start paying attention to those images, you will go from an intellectual um, student into a person that knows. And this is the, the knowing part of Gnosis. And I'd like to talk about some other symbolism. The lion is the king of the animal kingdom and it's symbolic of your real being within. Also, there's a snake. And the snake, uh, in Christian terms, snakes are looked upon as something not so good. But in Gnostic terms, can be either positive or negative. For instance, if the head of the snake is up, that's a good thing, because it represents the kundalini of the spinal column. If the head is down, uh, that's a negative symbol. It means that, well, what does it mean, Jim? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is there any other symbols we could we could give a new person entering into this for the very first time, from uh, intellectual n knowledge to knowing? How do you, how do you get a person to start knowing? It's dream yoga, isn't it? Yeah. So when you mention the the serpent looking down or going down, it's a stage of degeneration. Yeah. You know, it means our spine is connects. The three brains, we mentioned that before, we have three brains. The intellectual brain, everybody knows about it. The emotional brain, which is our own heart. This is why emotional intelligence comes from there. And the sexual, instinctive and motor brain, which is our own genitals. This is why we have to learn to have a tremendous respect for sex and also emotions and also the intellect because they are all connected with each other. So the situation is, you know, we have to, when we say knowledge, knowing or gnosis, the key point is go to study yourself. Do you know who you are? Do we know who we are? And we don't need a guru, do we? As Samuel said, you don't need me yes. necessarily. Don't follow a guru, a guru, right? The most beautiful part of Gnostic teachings, you know, gnosis, uh, as a way of life, is that don't follow anybody. Follow your real being. Follow your inner being. Follow your God within yourself. Yes. You know, the king of the universe and the queen of the universe that become one within our spirit or our monad. So this is extremely important. And to be able to listen, to pay attention to what you describe, Rick, uh, we have to learn to meditate. Meditation means having a dialogue with our monad, with our real being, with our spiritual being, with the king of the universe that lives within ourselves. Because knowledge is coming from there. Knowledge and wisdom and love and consciousness, they are all coming from, you know, the creator of the universe. And we are all a tiny little piece of that creator. Because our real being is really our spiritual being, our spirit connected with our matter, of course, that gave us life. But life existed before the creation itself, you know, through the absolute. 
So learning to know ourselves is the key point, or self-knowledge. You know, in ancient Greece, at the entrance of the temple of Delphos, Delphi, there was a sentence, you know, we can still read it in ancient Greek. O man, woman, know yourself, and you will know the gods and the universe. As we said, the ancient gods are the same angels, archangels, Elohim, superior cosmic beings that have the power to create planets, solar systems, constellations, and even galaxies. Jesus Christ is a cosmo creator of galaxies. Listen to my words. He has the power and the knowledge to create galaxies and even groups of galaxies organized. Incredible, fantastic, unbelievable. Yes, it does. It looks like that. But, well, this is something that we should learn to immerse within ourselves to discover the truth of it. So we say that Jesus Christ is the chief of the White Lodge. Well, this is something, of course, to be discussed and to be meditated. So meditation, what you mentioned, Rick, in the morning when we wake up, having that dialogue with our real being, with the divinity within ourselves, means not only asking questions, means also listening to their answers, to the answers from the divinity. At the beginning, will be a very blurry communication, but eventually it will become more and more clear. Samael Onveor, the founder of the School of Gnostic Anthropology, he had the power and the knowledge to see his real being face to face, his divine father, divine mother, face to face. He could talk to them. And this is the key point. When we develop that capability, it's because we are awakening intuition. Intuition, this is the Aquarian age, this is the age of intuition. If a student progresses in this work, establishes a dialogue with their real being, and then at some point develops uh, some of their extra sensory perceptions that, that are atrophied, the student can go into the Akashic records and find out the truth for him and herself, right? Yeah, well, the Akashi records, you know, are mentioned in every esoteric school. They are actually the fourth dimension. You know, this magnetic field of the Earth and of every atomic particle or cellular particle or also... So there's really no secrets in the universe, really, is it? When, when you talk of the Akashic records, on, in the physical world, we have uh, WikiLeaks, we have uh, societies like the CIA, the FBI, all of these people who have secrets, national secrets... Um, espionage, all kinds of intrigue going on in the physical world, but in the in, in in the universe, there is no secret, really, right? You know, everything is recorded within the memories. We can call it the memories of nature. When I take a picture of someone, you know, how is it possible that I can get the image printed, you know, in a piece of material? How is it possible? The only explanation is that through the etheric field, the magnetic field of the earth, that electricity, you know, captures the image of the person or, or the location I'm trying to, you know, capture. And then it will go, it will be printed eventually in a piece of matter, paper, whatever, and that becomes the picture. But the situation is, if you are able, capable of awakening your third eye or clairvoyance or creative imagination, you know, connected with the pituitary gland, you'll be able to see the memories of nature. You will be able to study the memories of nature. So whatever has happened in the universe, within planet Earth, within every human life on Earth is already recorded. So be careful, my dear friend who is listening right now. Whoever is listening, everything we do, every thought is already recorded. If you uh, think of the movie 1984, where they had cameras in the walls and uh, the government of that era was uh, Big Brother, 
and the government knew everything you were doing, well, you ain't seen nothing yet because the universe has um, the Akashic Records, as you just spoke about, you know. You know, um, if we in the future develop the technology to create a huge, you know, gigantic television set connected with the fourth dimension and more developed than the actual technology, we'll be able to see the memories of nature, we'll be able to see the reality of Moses when he was performing his miracles. We'll be able to see the reality of Jesus Christ, the reality of Buddha, the reality of all masters from the past, historically speaking, because history is recorded. The true history of the universe is recorded. Maybe we won't like what we are going to see one day, but it is there. Well, some people believe that the technology is already developed. It's already developed. There's a lot of inventions and so forth that have not really found their way to uh, popular uh, knowledge because uh, we think there's a lot of, well, black ops, but uh, uh, secret um, discoveries that uh, are not being released to the general public. So, You know, this is more than possible, but the point is this. You don't need an instrument, a physical instrument, to perceive that reality if you learn to awaken your superior senses. Yeah. Now, this is something very important that we mentioned in the lecture about karma dharma. When we die, remember we continue our life on the other side with a molecular body and also with a mental body, which is an atomic body. We continue our life on the other side. That matter or energy is fed, feed, you know, with the spirit. The electricity, you know, continues giving us life on the other side. Even there is no more electricity in the physical body, the cellular body, but the molecular body that we already have and our atomic body or mind continue alive on the other side. Well, we are all going to be judged by the laws of karma or the angels of cosmic justice. They will be telling us there is a book of life for each one of us. Do you remember that you did this or that? And we will say, no, we, I don't remember that, you know. Well, they will show us the memories of nature. So remember my words. If you have committed crimes that were never discovered here on earth by the law of the humans or the subhumans, and you believe that you were so intelligent because nobody discovered you on the other side my friend you are already in troubles because you are going to be judged on the other side and every tear that you produced in the eyes of every human being on earth you will be crying every tear that you created and you will have to pay the same way that will contribute to awaken your soul, your consciousness, and to annihilate your ego, the psychology, animal psychology, the psychology of me, 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 instead of us, because we are all important. So the purpose of cosmic law is basically that, you know, cosmic justice, divine justice. Remember, there is an equilibrium in the universe. So there is divine justice, either we like it or not. Um, also, we have lectures coming up. I'm not sure what the timetable is, but Dream Yoga is one of the lectures that's um, taught by Samael Unver, and it will be on the list of our one of our future podcasts. But we've given you a couple of symbols so far to start off the Dream Yoga process. And Dream Yoga is nothing more than paying attention to every aspect of your dream and even writing it down. And if you don't understand what something is now, well, in the future, if you keep uh, doing this, you will uh, slowly start to uh, uncover the language, decipher things and figure things out. You might see something in a dream today that you don't understand. But a year from now, five years from now, you might see the same thing from a slightly different point of view. And then you will be saying, oh, now I understand that. 
And I'd like to warn people not to go to dream interpreters because they don't know anything more than you. And each message from your monad to you is specifically designed for you. And only you can interpret that properly. It might take a little bit of time. So basically, you know, meditation is the key word, okay? As you said, Rick, we have to learn to practice meditation 24 hours a day if it is possible. The, main, the most important time is before we go to sleep or very early in the morning after we wake up to establish a relationship with our real being, with our monad, with God within, with our, you know, king of the universe or queen of the universe also that lives within ourselves. So Samael Onveo recommends to combine prayer with meditation. Let's say I cannot meditate, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm exhausted, I'm tired, I'm confused. I don't know what to do with my life. Then pray. God, divine being, you who are my real being, please help me. Help me to learn to meditate. Teach me how to connect with you. And eventually it will happen. There is a moment that our real being who's been always helping us, even if we never noticed it before, now we will establish that relationship. So those people who are skeptical, those people who are atheist, we're asking them to look for different options in their lives. Okay, it, they are right. You're right when you criticize fanatic religious individuals who are totally lost and sometimes they commit crazy, you know, acts because of their irresponsibility regarding their own religions. You're right regarding that. Maybe you walk away from religion because of that. But now, remember there is a center point, which is we disagree with atheism because it's an incomplete perception of reality. And we also disagree with fanatic religious individuals. Both are wrong. Both are incomplete. So we have to go into the center to understand, you know, creation and evolution, both are part of reality. You know, those people who consider themselves spiritual or others who consider themselves materialistic, both are wrong, both are incomplete because life is a spirit and matter, both. So Gnostic anthropology teaches how to be real, how to be realistic. Learning to meditate means learning to explore ourselves, learning to know who we are. We are a spirit and matter, we are both. So we are a spiritual beings, we have a body, we have a mind, but within matter is the feminine aspect of the divinity, helping us to organize our lives, helping us to live, because life is also a school of learning. Remember that. We are here to learn. We are here to ascend into higher levels of consciousness. The problem is through evolution, we will never get there. It has to be a tremendous re-evolution because evolution is a mechanical law. Thank you for downloading this podcast. My name is Richard Rucroft. My co-host is E. Jim G. Ross. The website is rickyradio.com. We invite your comments and emails. The email uh, address is gnosticradio at gmail.com. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much, Rick, for inviting me here. It's a great pleasure and, and a great honor to be here tonight or today. And thank you for our listeners for being with us. We appreciate, you know, your participation. And we would love to get your opinion. It's very, very important to us. In the future, we will establish a dialogue, a more direct dialogue with all of you. In thank you again. In, in the future, we'll probably end up doing a mailing list of some kind. So on. Um, Anybody would like to uh, contribute to sending us messages? Would you, if you'd like to be on the mailing list, gnosticradio at gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you.